Conspiracy theories are nothing new. Whether it's about the moon landings being faked, shape-shifting lizard people, or flat earth diehards, there are millions of people who believe in cover-ups and plots to deceive and control us. We invited James Ball, an investigative journalist and author, to talk about perhaps the biggest and potentially the most dangerous conspiracy group out there, QAnon. QAnon grew out of an online message board back in 2017 and quickly gained momentum and followers, its influence eventually reaching all the way to the White House. So strap on your tinfoil hat as we learn more about the dangers of QAnon. James Ball, thank you very much for coming on to On The Record. Um, first question, can you tell me something about QAnon that would scare the heck out of you? Um, possibly that people in maybe 20 plus countries believe it. There are probably about 2% of the population in America will admit to being signed up to it. And a heck of a lot of them have guns. And it's been connected to who attempts in Germany, to murders in the UK, to kidnappings. It is a scary thing. Okay, now I know it's a part of our jobs to be curious, but I'm very intrigued to know why you started to write a book about QAnon. I mean, what, why did you want to go down this rabbit hole? I think the honest answer is that I got interested in QAnon because it's really stupid. It starts... It's simple, but it just, it's just... It's just dumb. It, um, it starts on 4chan, which is this sort of forum populated by teenage boys who like trolling online. And its big thing was that President Trump was leading a secret resistance that would get uh, Hillary Clinton arrested within a couple of weeks, which obviously didn't happen. And so why six, seven years on from that, are people still thinking that it's this big, huge, true conspiracy? And so that question, how can something that's so dumb and was so wrong become so dangerous? That well, gets you interested, That's right? my next question. I mean, <laughs> you say it's stupid and dumb, but for some reason, uh, for some people, it's very real. So how did it gain traction? How did it become this niche site? And it, how did it become so powerful? So I think the important thing is you don't actually have to be dumb to get pulled into QAnon. It's actually quite clever, quite curious people who will. And it's because it never stuck with what the initial poster said, that, you know, it was about Clinton getting arrested. Because it never really had a leader, you know, like cults have a leader who says, yes, this is what we believe, no, this isn't. It kept pulling in more and more conspiracies. It pulled in anti-Semitism, it pulled in Islamophobic conspiracies, all sorts of different things kind of glued into it. And so a guy I talked to in the book says it kind of became the conspiracy theory that ate all the other conspiracy theories. And I really liked that phrase. So when did it gain its legitimacy when it became, I don't know, I don't want to say a trusted site, but it just started to get bigger than what it should be. So the thing with, the thing when it was on 4chan is everyone kind of knew they were joking. They sort of knew it was someone messing with them and playing about, but it was quite fun to act as if you believed it and to see if you could get far right sites to write it up and that kind of thing. And what changed it was influencers. And there's loads of YouTube influencers particularly who like doing videos on conspiracy theories. And when a new one starts doing numbers, they'll move and try that out. You know, I think some of them believe what they're saying, but some of them literally just go with whatever works. And so they look on Reddit, they look on YouTube, they, they look on 4chan, they look around the place to kind of see, hey, what might break through? And QAnon did huge numbers. And these people didn't really know it came off 4chan. They didn't know, it, you know, the sillier sides of it. They're going to get explained in these really nicely packaged videos. That's when it starts going viral. Well, you've described QAnon as a, a rare movement that can radicalize an Andrew Tate loving teenager and his Holland and Barrett's mum. Um, I was going to say, out of those two, who would you say is the most vulnerable? So the interesting thing is, I think who's most susceptible to QAnon, I'd probably go with the mom. 
um, a lot of people get pulled into conspiracy theories through wellness. And people get into wellness for quite legitimate reasons. Women are more likely to suffer from chronic pain conditions and conventional medicine is rubbish and doesn't really try to help them. Doctors are often really unsympathetic. They don't sort of treat these conditions seriously. They don't listen to them. And so they start moving to an alternative and they're angry with the mainstream. There's a real grievance there. And so if you start hearing that big farmers bad, that's gonna sound right to you. If you start thinking that they're up to something actively maligned with vaccines, that sounds plausible. And so you get pulled into deeper and deeper into it until you start thinking Bill Gates is microchipping people. So I think they're most likely to get pulled in, but I think they're the most dangerous people when they are pulled in is the men. So I think women are more likely to be pulled into it and probably are the majority of QAnon now, but I think it's the men in QAnon that are the most likely to get violent. And how much did the, the COVID pandemic play its part as well? I think the pandemic had two big effects on QAnon in particular and conspiracy theories in general. Um, on conspiracy theories in general, we were all stuck at home. We all had a lot of time. We we're all sort of browsing around. We were a bit bored. We we're in a bad mood. That's exactly the circumstances that's going to send you down the YouTube rabbit hole. And so, you know, QAnon being of the moment anyway, it really helped QAnon. But you also, for once, had a really weird government power to push against. Like you had this new disease that wasn't there before and now somehow we've got to shut down the world for it. Yeah. The government says you can't walk your- We're all in the your... same situation. Yeah. So we're all kind of bounded by the that one The government says you moment, can't yeah. walk your dog, but you've got to have a jab to be able to go into places. Like it was the biggest extension of state authority in almost all of our lifetimes. Certainly in Western democracies it was, but I think in most countries. And so it's obviously going to get a pushback of, well, are we sure this is real? Are we sure this isn't a control thing? And so together, that's going to have a big effect on convincing people of conspiracy. You've described QAnon as well as the first digital virus. Um, two things. One, what do you mean by that? And two, what's going to be the next digital virus. What, what, what can you tell us from all your, your research and yeah, so, that rabbit hole you went down? <laughs> so the reason I'd say it's the first digital virus is usually if we talk about computer viruses, we mean something that makes your laptop not work or you've got to pay some hackers some money. Um, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that infects us, but instead of traveling through water or through droplets in the air, travels through the internet. And I use this because no one's controlling QAnon. It's not that there's some North Korean group behind it or some Russian disinformation mastermind who's calling the shots. It's evolved, it changes, no one's running it. And it's but, not so, alive. So how can you regulate something like that? This is actually, <laughs> it's very powerful beyond belief. So who could regulate something like this? I, I think, in the same way as you don't say, how do we regulate a virus? You know, we could try banning the common cold. It'd be great if it would work, but <laughs> yeah. it wouldn't. We look at what we can do to tackle them. And so you might look at what can you do about people who are deliberately creating or spreading them? What can you do to stop them spreading early? So, you know, when you see influencers start to push a new conspiracy theory, maybe tackle it before it goes globally viral rather than after. Maybe put content warnings and things like that earlier so you don't have to ban free speech. Um, so it's that kind of public health, how can we make it spread slower approach so that we don't end up having to take drastic action when it's big. You know, we don't want an information lockdown. Well, yeah, that's very true. Um, another, um, I suppose, big talking point lately has been artificial intelligence, AI. How is that going to be a disruptor for something like QAnon moving forward? I mean, one of the scary things is that you see with QAnon a lot of very cleverly edited videos. When you can fully deepfake convincingly, it's going to be really, really difficult to convince some people that it didn't happen. We're going to have to think about how could you watermark, how could you maybe use blockchain or 
something like that to go, this is real information. And AI is going to turn that into a race. It's not going to make new problems in this area, but it's going to make all of the existing ones harder to solve. Is that the next uh, digital virus, would you say, AI? I think AI will probably be an accelerant of the next digital virus, but it could be anything. I mean, which ideas catch on is really interesting to me because you can't predict it. So one at the moment is 15 minute cities, which has turned into this global conspiracy that you won't be allowed to leave the area around your house without a government permit. And this came from a like traffic calming plan in Oxford. Like, a boring local government, let's try and reduce air pollution thing, has turned into a global conspiracy. In your experience, in, uh, in all your research, when does something become a conspiracy? So it's hard to say a lot of things that sound like conspiracy theories end up being true. You know, we have to, <laughs> we have to admit this. Sometimes there really is a conspiracy. I think where it turns into a silly conspiracy theory is when there's no evidence that would persuade someone off it, or when generally if it would involve thousands of people to knowingly be acting in on something, it's probably not happening. So Watergate would have sounded like a conspiracy theory. The president paid these people to burgle and it was like known in the White House, but it only required maybe 15 or 20 people to know about it. And you could start finding evidence that connected it rather than evidence that didn't. And I think, you know, I've worked as an investigative journalist. People think it's going, how are these things connected? And actually, it's about kicking your story apart and going, how might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? How can I prove this happened? And that's the difference between proving a conspiracy and going into a conspiracy theory. You've said recently that QAnon is exploited by grifters. What do you mean by that? I think there are people who take advantage of QAnon beliefs without ever believing it. And that can be people who will sell things to stop 5G mind control, which are usually just USB sticks with little lights in them. And they'll sell these USB sticks for $500. You know, that's a grift. There's people who will use it to boost their following on YouTube or Facebook or X as it is now. And they don't care that they're like ruining people's relationships and their lives and getting them in trouble with the law. And you could even say there's politicians that take advantage of it, knowing that even though these conspiracies are dangerous, it animates their followers. And so, you know, Donald Trump very blatantly flirts with QAnon on the stage and at his rallies. I would class him as a grifter for that. You would accuse, uh... Donald Trump of being a grifter. I've accused him of worse. <laughs> okay, let's not go into that. <laughs> okay, um, finally, um, what's the difference between a cult and a movement? It's a good question. And I suspect uh, part of it is like a terrorist and a freedom fighter. It depends if you agree. But I think a cult fundamentally exploits its members and a movement fundamentally empowers them. You know, a movement gives you more than you give to it. Uh, and it empowers you and it makes your life better. A cult tries to make you feel like it's doing that and then takes more and more from you. And I think as well, a movement doesn't require you to disconnect from your real life, from your real friends, from your family. And a cult does because that's the only way it can carry on leeching off you. So I think movements are great. People join movements, but do think, is it taking from me or is it giving to me? Uh, James Ball, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us uh, on the record. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.